Welcome to the World of Art with Paul Creamy. Uh, tonight, I decided to do a black and white photo. I brought this photo, it's the coast of LA, and I taken this picture about 30 years ago, and I've done a bunch of paintings of the coast of LA and the coast of Massachusetts and New York and uh, Maine and a whole bunch of different places. I really love black and white. I'm a printmaker at heart. And so I really think that black and white is a fabulous way of painting and doing prints. So tonight I'm going to do this. I brought a painting of the coast of L.A. and it's behind me. I'm going to put it up for a second so you get to see it. It's quite a nice painting. Uh, <clears throat> I was going from Northern California all the way down to LA to visit my son, John Paul. And it, he was uh, gonna be 23 at the time, and now he's 45 or 46, somewhere in there. And uh, he just had a birthday, I think he's 46 or 47, I don't know, whatever he is, he is. We just went and visited him, he's living in Bend, Oregon. So I love the fog and the rocks and the water. And I love the feeling, it, you, you almost feel present in the painting. And that's one of my uh, destinations when I do a painting. I like the idea that you can feel like you're standing right there looking at it. And that to me is, is a great way of painting and a great way of expressing yourself. And it's something that you should think about when you paint. I always try to bring people into the painting. I think Van Gogh was one of the best at that. He made you feel like you were standing right then and there. I watched a movie of Van Gogh coming back from uh, San Francisco with uh, my wife. We were coming back from Ben, Oregon, and we had a fly to San Francisco to change planes and then from ch to Boston. So I got to watch three or four, three, at least three paintings, or uh, three paintings, three movies. So this particular photograph, where I put it in my pocket, has a lot of nice things going on. I, I like the sky, I like, you know, photographs have three dimensional things. They have the bottom, the middle, and the top. And, it, and if you can do a photograph or a painting with those three elements, then you're going to be set pretty well and the painting will come out pretty nice. Most of the time people don't realize how important it is to balance out everything. So with this is I'm going to start with the sky. So I've mixed the gesso with white. The gesso is the color that they put on the canvas. This happens to have black gesso. I like painting on these black canvases immensely. I've been doing it forever. And before they started making black canvases, I used to paint the canvases with black gesso. It cost a lot more money, but it, I love the idea that I could paint the canvas with the black gesso and make it. What happens is the painting comes to life. Although we're going to do black and white tonight, so you, you probably won't see as much dynamics as you will with the color. But my daughter graduated from Pratt, and she's a magnificent artist, and Ellen Creamy Trent, she's on Instagram and Facebook and all of those does fantastic work. It took her forever to get the idea to paint the canvas black or bike black canvases. She's so stubborn, like most artists, they want to do it until they realize they, that I'm right and they're wrong, thank God. But just because she's my daughter doesn't mean she listens to me, like most women. As being a former hairstylist, <laughs> I learned early on that they like to talk and they don't like to listen. So everything was yes, dear. It's still yes, dear. That's how you stay married for 40, 54, 55 years. You have a relationship with somebody and it's got to be yes, dear, all the time. So I'm just going to quickly get some of the elements into this painting, getting this background sky in, and then the rocks will be somewhere in here, and then the water will be down the bottom. And I don't want to get to the point where you try not to get 
everything set up so the middle of the canvas is in control. So like the photograph, the photograph is not the middle of the photograph. So, you, so that's an element that you should learn how to do a third, a third, and a third. And it makes a huge difference in the way the photograph comes out and the way the painting comes out. I'm talking this way to you because I know what I'm doing, but you know, if you're a beginner and you're just starting, or you've been painting a long time and you can't figure out why your paintings aren't winning awards and getting into these big shows, the judges in these shows, they drive you to nuts. I mean, they can drive you out of your mind. But that's one of the things they'll throw out right away. Or oh, they'll take it, they'll put it in the show, but you'll never get an award. And getting an award makes the whole thing worthwhile. You know, get a little more recognition, get a little more money for your paintings, you know. If you came to my studio, you'd see buckets and buckets full of awards. I mean, I started getting awards when I was a little kid. And not because I was great, because, because I was just a kid. But I think if you have this kind of goal in life that you're going to do what you're going to do, I think that that makes a difference. To get the most knowledge you can out of the best artist you know. How you drove my artist friends crazy as a kid. Oh my God. Even as I got older, forever asking questions. And why do you do this? And why do you do that? How come you don't do this? I'd go out painting with some of my uh, artist friends, and it's, they were kind of wild, to tell you the truth. I was kind of shocked the way they talked to people. You don't you see I'm painting? I don't want you to bother me and all that stuff. I mean, I've never been that kind of person. I thought they were kind of rude. But I understand. So I try to go to places where there's not a lot of people. I was in Maine underneath this bridge on this concrete platform. And I'm there for like five or six hours painting this beautiful stream. And I'm thinking I'm all by myself. And finally I turn around and get some lunch. It's like 60 people taking pictures. But nobody bothered me. Nobody came up and said, oh, I like what you're doing or any of that nonsense. So I was completely involved in the painting in the whole process. And the painting did come out really nice. Well, this is the first layer. This kind of a painting, and any painting, I find out in my own way of painting that if I do layers on top of them, top of them, top of them, I get better results. My brother, who I loved, passed away when he was 71 on his birthday, and uh, his wife just went into a nursing home and uh, so my niece came by with a bunch of paintings that I had given my brother throughout the years. And one of the paintings I put into the Plymouth show, it was so dynamic. I wish I had it with me. I was going to bring it. Next time I come, after this show's over, I'll bring it and I'll show you. I mean, I was at the time experimenting with these incredible skies. And this sky is so powerful in this particular painting. I was shocked to see it come back. My brother was one of those guys, you know, he, ever since he was a kid, he'd say, I'm going to hit this, I'm going to win this money, I'm going to win this money, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. He hit the lottery three times. I swear, because he said it so often that it became part of his DNA. I mean, he couldn't go buy a store without stopping and buying a scratch ticket. But he played and he hit he wound up getting, the first time he hit, he wound up getting $97,000 in his hand for some reason. I don't know, what it, after he got through getting paid or whatever. And he's the one that bought that particular painting. I was going to sell it to somebody else, and he said, no, what are you going to sell it for? And I said, $1,500. Now, this is like quite a few years ago. And 
I turned around and he handed me $1,500 in $100 bills. I said, wow, you don't have to do that. He said, oh no, this is what you do for a living. You know, that helped pay for my daughter to go to Notre Dame and hang them part of the tuition. All right, so the top is going to be lighter. I'm going to get back and I'm going to dry this up and I'm going to make the top lighter and blend it. So that's just an overview. If you came to my studio at 1000 Main Street in Hanson, it's in the old uh, popcorn factory. I have a whole wall full of these beautiful black and white paintings. And, and I keep on wanting to do more and more. So I'm going to go back and do some more white here. Because this has a lot of nice white on the top up here. Blend it down. I spent almost two hours today going through my photos. And I have been to so many different places and I'm not bragging about it. I just got, I love to take photographs. Some of my photographs are, I have friends that say, you should enter your photographs into these shows. And I used to do that because when they, they get on my case. And then I'd feel, if I won an award, that the person that's a photographer got gypped. You know, here I am, an artist, and I'm winning these photography awards. But my friend Marie would say, well, the photograph won the award. Not, not because you're not a photographer. It was the photograph. Um, but I have all of these beautiful photos, and I'll give you an example. In 1977, I did a photograph of Jenny, Jenny Grist Mill in Plymouth, and um, I did a whole bunch of photographs. I'm talking about a, probably a whole row, whole series of shots, and I wound up painting that particular painting. And I opened up a beauty parlor in the 80s in Plymouth. It was called Heirloom. And uh, I hung up that painting. I'm telling you this story because it's kind of really funny. I hung up that painting in the beauty parlor, and it's in a photograph with all of the help. And it's the opening for the show, for the, stu uh, the uh, uh, hairdressing shop. And we're all, all the girls are sitting down, and I'm sitting down beside them. And what I'm telling you is that my aunt came in and fell in love with that picture, and I literally took it off the wall and took it home. And it was my father's sister. And so I never said anything to her. I said, Yeah, you can have it. But she never gave me a chance to sign it. So. My Aunt Vicky was tough as woodpecker lips. They don't come any tougher than my Aunt Vicky. Anyway, so I loved her. She was really sweet and tough. But as she got older, she got even harder and more tougher. And uh, she has her grandson 
sign the painting. And I think she had him sign it because she wanted him to get it. Because after she passes, my cousin calls me up and says, will you come to the house? I want to show you something. And she, she wound up with the painting. And she says, did you do this painting? I says, yeah, I gave it to Aunt Vicky. And she says, well, Aunt Vicky made my son sign the can, uh, painting. She said, he, you painted this painting. And he said, no, I didn't. And she said, well, she was difficult, like I said. And she said, yes, you did. And so he signed the painting. So my cousin had me sign it, paint over the signature and paint it. So I'm telling you this because Today I was going through all of my photographs and I found a whole series from 1977 of the Jenny Grist Mill that I had done the painting and it was just like the painting, the photograph. I got a big kick out of it. I, I think the, the photograph probably come out better than, I mean the painting come out better than the photograph. And my cousin has it and she's going to give it to that young, her young son. I might have him sign it again, just for the fun of it. You really can't see this in the, in the photograph because it's too far away. The gray area in this area is land up in here. And it's got a bit of a fog in this water on the other side and the water's crashing over the uh, rocks. So I'm gonna try doing that. That subtle gray. then the real white. Nice. Well, this is what I do all day long. I stand here and I I go over and over and over and dry it, go over it, and dry it again. I told you that story about my cousin because she's one of my patrons. She's, her and her husband, my cousin Albert, uh, have bought quite a few of my paintings throughout the years. They really, she really loves my work and so didn't her husband. I mean, I had a, I had a gallery in Cordage Park in the 90s and God, I had it for like three years, and I had the two beauty parlors in this gallery. Oh, God, talking about four kids. Always, always doing something. I liked being busy, and I still am like to be busy. I have a job at Home Depot, but I went to help somebody, and uh, you know, it was one of those senior moments you should know better kind of thing. Uh, this, this guy must have been four foot three or four foot five. His wife was about a foot and a half, maybe two feet taller with a little baby. And uh, they walked up to me and said, will you help me? I need to get a, some concrete. 
Uh, so I took them over where the concrete was and the kid put it in the, um, a cot. And then he took it out to the, put it in the car. And the wife came in and said to me, will you come and help my husband? He can't get the ba uh, bag of concrete out of the car. And you know, at 76, I shouldn't be lifting an 80-pound bag of concrete. So I wound up getting a pinched nerve in my back for the last month. I had to go to the VA and get some treatment. And it still bothers me. And now I, my wife says, now see, you have to realize, Paul, you're 76 years old. You think you're 70. You, th you think you're more like 50 or 45, and you're not. Even though you're in good shape, you're still not that strong to be lifting an 80-pound bag of concrete out of a cot. And she's absolutely right. Uh, But I felt bad for this guy. He couldn't get the he couldn't he couldn't even reach down to get the bag out of the cart. That's how small he was. Oh, God bless him. So everybody thinks that when you do black and white paintings, they're so easy. They're 10 times more difficult than doing color. And you have to really take your time and look at what you're doing and keep on going over and over and over and over. Eventually, like I said, the, the painting will come out like the one I showed you. All right, so I'm going to put some of the rocks in to show you. As we go further along down the rocks, I'm going to add a little more white because these rocks are different than those. These rocks have water on them, so it's made them grayer. So I'm a young artist learning how to paint. So there's this artist in Rockland, and the magnificent oh water. He could paint water. Oh my God, fantastic! And I just thought the world of him. So I, I wanted to take a class with him, and I I signed up to take a class, and I paid him and. Uh, after two weeks, he walked up to me and he gave me my money back and said, you, you are too talented to be paying me to teach you how to paint. 
I said, well, I wanted to learn how to paint water. He says, you can paint anything. You just set your mind to it. You're a really talented artist. And he threw me out of the class. And I didn't say a thing. I just kept doing what he was doing. And he walked over and he said, you're already doing what I do already. He says, you don't need to, to do this. It was, that, that was the time I was doing that painting my, my brother got from me. I took lessons from this woman in Cohasset and, and him, Ed. And uh, oh, fabulous people, fabulous artist. And I think everybody should take lessons from somebody. You always learn something, believe it or not. Don't think you're so good you don't need to take lessons or you don't need. I went to the museum school. I was in the museum school when I was a youngster. I love the museum school. I still to this day love it. I'd go back to school even if it's 76. I'd go back and teach people how to do printing. Master printmaker. You know, I haven't made millions and millions of dollars like some of my artist friends in, throughout the year. I've never been that kind of a person. I could care less. I have a wife and four kids, and I did the hairdressing. and the, all. I, I did all of these things because I enjoyed doing it. My father was a barber. He taught me how to cut hair when I was a kid. He wanted me to be a barber. I couldn't stand the barber shop. Oh, my God. Nonsense. Uh, but I liked, I had a friend of mine that was a hairdresser and he says, you know, you, you know how to cut hair, you should become a hairstylist with women. And he talked me into doing it and, and I wound up doing it for like 44 years. It was pretty good. All right, so we're getting there. See, now it's starting to take shape. You're starting to see really good stuff happening. Just keep looking at the photograph. Keep looking at what you're doing. I'm going to step back and take a look. In the old days, I used to use this reducing mirror, and it would push the painting way back. And somebody was having a tough time at, in the building that I used to be in, and I wound up giving it away. Let's put a little water coming down on the rocks on this side. Oh, time is slipping away. I love it. You got Carol, she's so cute. Oh, God. 
No longer Barbara. Just keep touching the canvas with the brush a tiny bit. You'll start to see it take shape. Like you're starting to see it take shape now. So I'm mixing the gesso with the white paint. Let's dry this a little. Now one of the most important things that I learned from Ed as an artist and when he did water I mean water, he always put this line, there's a line along this edge right here. And it gives a, the essence of the water in a beautiful way. And I've been doing that ever since he taught me. And it, I always love the way the, the water comes out. Little tiny things like that. that that's, that's the thing I wanted to learn from him. You know, and I had such great friends in those days. I was in my 30s by that time, and, and I had all these people telling me what to do and how to do it, and they were fabulous. I've done that. I've helped a lot of other artists throughout the years, especially with the printmaking, because printmaking is such a demanding thing. It's such a, you have to have a press, and, and the press is not, not easy to get. Not very expensive. I bought one 
when I bought my house in Pembroke, I put it in my basement, and it took me four years to pay it off. And it was, uh, I don't know, maybe three or four thousand dollars, maybe five thousand. And I paid it off for a long time, I know that. God. And I had it for a long time, and I had it moved three or four times. Every time I moved it, it cost me a thousand dollars, and it weighed 2,000 pounds. It's etching press. And I didn't have it for 12 years. When, I moved, when they kicked us out of the Codman building and they made it into condos, I sold the press. Now I paid, like I said, $3,000 or something like that in the 70s, 72, 73. And I sold it. And let me think. Got to be 19 years ago, or oh, something crazy like that. 17 years, 18 years ago. I had to wait a long time to get an, another one. And I finally bought another one. And it's really weird. I wound up paying $3,000 for the one I found. It was secondhand. I got it from a museum in Decorvita. Another lady bought it. She had it for a couple of years. We were supposed to buy it together, but she thought that she could make money with it, which she never did. And so she kicked me out of the sale. We were supposed to split it. And maybe that wasn't a good thing anyways. It wasn't going to work out. She didn't know what she was doing. And so I was patient about it. And then she moved to South Carolina, and I wound up buying it off of her for $3,000. Now I moved it to uh, Hanson. And I moved it from the fifth floor to the third floor. And then I moved it to Hanson and the same guy that moved it down from the third floor, fifth floor, uh, charged me very little money to move it. And very good guy. Excellent. Because it weighs 2,000 pounds. And it's so, oh, unbelievable. I've loved doing printmaking ever since I was a little kid when I used to do those linoleum cuts. Oh, my God. See me going over and over and over the same thing over and over and over. I want this to have the effect that it has in the photograph. I'm just touching the black on this side because the water has made the rocks a lot grayer than that side. And that's a dynamic side. It pushes the whole painting around. And the water goes all the way up here, whiter. So I'm kind of like blending it a little so that it sort of slides right into the picture both ways, up here and down below. I'm going to step back and take a look after I do a little drying.
Let me take a look. I'm going to come back towards Carol. My picture's done. I'll take my picture with me. Look at it. I think I've gotten pretty much what it looks like. I think I've got to make those some lines in the water in here and then a little bit darker in a stronger line. Although all of this is going way up and I don't have it going way up in my painting. So I might put some more emphasis on that. But I'm, I'm liking the way it feels. It's, it has a nice feeling. Time to get rid of the picture. You get caught up in the picture and it drives you crazy. And you know, if you're painting a painting like this, don't stay on top of it like I am. Sit back, go sit down in a rocking chair, like I go keep on walking back and taking a look. Uh, I sit in my rocking chair most of the time when I'm painting, and it sort of takes away the stress of trying to get it perfect. I have that kind of oriental, or it, I don't know if oriental, Asian attitude about, you know, nothing's perfect, God's perfect. They always have a mistake somewhere in their artwork. And it's kind of never perfect. And I think that's a good way of thinking. You know. I'm going to put some of those wattle knocks in here. Buy a ton of brushes, too. Spend some money. Buy the best brushes you can afford. And buy a bunch of them. I probably have 100 or 200 brushes. I got tons of these buckets full of brushes. Right along here today. Good. Carol doing a great job. I think Kevin's hiding out on me. Haven't heard much from him. Sometimes I, I think I keep rubbing the brush against the canvas here and, the, and there's not much paint on it. What I'm doing is I'm trying to blend it in, to soften it up. So it's not really 
jumping at it. Yeah, this is getting better. This particular show, I think it came along really nice and it worked out really good. I think uh, this was a good decision to use this uh, black and white painting. If you can paint black and white painting, it'll enhance your color paintings by 100%. Because it's the foundation of all art. In the Renaissance age, they did the whole entire painting in black and white and then painted the color on top. And that's the way, when I was a kid, that's the way I was taught at the museum school. But, oh, God, it's so long and hard to do all that stuff and then paint on top of it, uh, we get spoiled. The paints that we have are so much better than the paints they had. We're living in a great generation. And uh, the trouble is, I don't know if we're having great art. A lot of these people think art is something they do with the camera or with uh, um, all the nonsense they have. I still think Norman Rockwell was one of my favorite artists, and I'm Thrilled to see him sell his paintings for, they just auctioned off one of his paintings for $16 million. As a kid, I would be doing my paper route and taking a, a Saturday evening posts and the, all of the things that he did. I couldn't wait for them to come out. Ugh. You can tell my kind of IQ when I'd say there was two of my favorite artists, Norman Rockwell and Salvador Dali. That gives you some idea of who, what I think and how I feel. Because Salvador Dali was one of my favorite artists too, and I just couldn't understand how he could be so fantastic. And uh, the stuff he did. But he was on the other side of his mind. I mean, we, most Rockwell, uh, I mean, Norman Rockwell, he was the everyday kind of guy. And Salvador Dali, <laughs> I remember he was on one of those TV shows at night with a, a, a space helmet on with uh, Cupid dolls on it. He had stuck his head through the window of Macy's, almost got his head decapitated. I don't know how he didn't get hurt from that. And that night he shows up on the, the Pa show, John, I forget his first name, but I think uh, I'm terrible on names, but watching that on TV, I says, oh my God, this guy's incredible. His work was incredible. So that gives you some idea of the range of things that I do. If you went to my studio and you'd see a painting like this and then you'd see something abstract and you'd say, how can you do that? And I tell people, abstract art comes from your soul. And when you do something that's like this from a photograph that you've taken, it comes from everybody can do it. It comes from nature. It comes from what you see. But what you experience in your inner heart, in your mind, and you do something with it, and it's, it's personable. It's hard to explain to people that abstract art is not because they're trying to do something better than what you're trying to see. They're trying to give you an insight of how they feel about inside themselves. And so I, I'm constantly doing these prints, and they're so far out. And I don't know. And I watched this movie with Van Gogh coming home on the plane. And this priest is hollering at Van Gogh. He's holding this painting and he's saying, this is a piece of crap. This is terrible. Who told you you could paint? This is disgusting. You're not an artist. This is, this is not even a painting. And Van Gogh looked at him and said, in, I'm not painting these paintings for this time. I'm painting them for 100 years from now when people will stand in line all day and they'll pay millions and millions of dollars for my paintings. And the priest looked at him and said, where did you get that from? And he says, from Jesus. My father was a minister and I was going to be a minister, but I just couldn't make the people understand how I felt about being a minister. And I decided I'd rather be a painter and 
Jesus, and the priest said, where did you get this information from? He says, Jesus, Jesus told me that. And look at, look at what happened in Van Gogh's life. I mean, he never sold the painting. When, they, when he died in the wake, when people would came to his wake, they were giving his paintings away. In one of his paint, his drawing book, one of his sketchbooks, 126 years later, they found it. This person found it. I don't know what that thing must have been worth because, oh my God, it was gorgeous. All his sketches. This is starting to get to the point where I've got to dry it. Step back and look at it. Because I think it's almost finished. I'll put the photograph back up. I'll hold it up. We'll compare it. So I'm not trying to twist anybody's arm or show them anything that they don't know or anything. I'm painting this painting to show you that if you paint something like this and then you decide, okay, I want to do it in color, you're going to see the next painting that you paint from the same black and white is going to be a thousand times better if you start with the black canvas. The black canvas intensifies the color of the paint. It even does it with black and white. I mean, I've had people say to me, you know, that looks like a, a photograph on that canvas rather than a painting. And I said, yeah, well, that's because I've been painting black and white paintings since I was a little kid. And I love black and white. I think it has this dynamic dimension. And it's so powerful. It wants to pull you right into the picture. You feel like you're standing on this side of the sand looking at this painting and you're saying to yourself boy doesn't this have a strong powerful feeling and I said that's what this is all about that's what art is about it makes you stop take a look digest it find out what you like and what you don't like how you're affected by it and what it does for your personality and your life how you want to have it in your house. Put it over the couch or put it in the bedroom or put it wherever you want to put it. Art is a blessing. It's, a, it's an awareness of what we see and what we're around. An artist that does this kind of art is trying to get you to look and to experiment and to become part of it. I don't know how much time we got left. Five minutes? Okay. So, when you do a painting, I br I'll bring out the other painting so you get to see. I don't know if this is completely finished, so this one is completely finished. And so I'll pull this up and I'll put it on the easel. All of that's going on in this painting, the fog in the background and, and the water on the rocks and all of the movement and all of the, it's enticing. I stood there for hours looking at this and I took a bunch of photographs and I still have this photograph. I almost brought it tonight to show you with the, with the photograph. I don't know if I did bring it. I don't think I did. I put it back in the box. Uh, I been to so many different places. In fact, I got hired by the Ritz-Carlton to go to um, the Caribbean to one of their hotels and paint on the beach for two weeks. I called my wife and said, the president of the Rich Carlton called me and told me that we're gonna go to 
the Caribbean and pay, uh, stay at one of the hotels for 14 days, all on them. All I have to do is paint on the beach and talk to people. He had seen a gallery with a lot of my work and he loved what I did. And so my wife and I went. But I went to Puerto Rico, Mexico, Italy, France, Germany, uh, Spain, uh, so many different places. And I have taken tons and tons of photographs and I have painted lots and lots of different places. And I was going through these photographs today and I was saying, oh, I remember this one or I remember that one. And I have the painting all over the studio. The studio is 1000 Main Street, Hanson, and it's uh, right down from the train station. And I'm there when the sign's on the sidewalk, I'm there for sure. And uh, I'm there usually Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But now that I've hurt my back and I've been out of work, I've been there almost every day, except Sundays. I, I try to stay away from doing much on Sunday but going to Mass. I find that it uh, keeps the day as it's supposed to be, a day of prayer and a day of love. So this is the one that I brought in to show you, and this is the one I did today. And I think the one I did today is as dynamic as this one. I love the dark black on that corner and the white against it and the, the movement and the feeling of the fog and the, and the water behind. It's very subtle, very soft, very pleasing. All it really needs is a signature to finish it off, and it's done. So we're going to do this show once a month, maybe even twice a month, whenever Kevin comes to get me, because he's the best, and Carol's the best camera person I've seen in a long time, and she's got a great personality. And so I want to thank you. God bless. Good night.